Um, Welcome everybody, I'm Joe Lombardo. I'm the coordinator of United National Anti-War Coalition, UNAC, which is co-sponsoring, um, which is sponsoring the webinar today, which will be a conversation with uh, Scott Ritter. And my co-host is Margaret Flowers, um, who I will introduce in a minute. And um, also you're seeing Pippa, uh, Bartolotti there, who is going to um, help with some of the technical aspects. Um, besides sharing the live stream, let me just let you know for all folks who have um, uh, registered, which is everybody that's hearing my voice right now, um, uh, uh, 24 hours after the webinar, you will get uh, a notice from Zoom. And uh, in that notice, if you scroll down, there will be the link to the video of this webinar. Um, we'll just cut out some of the chatting in the very, very beginning and put a title page, and it will be on uh, YouTube. So you can share that also, or you can uh, see it again. So tonight we're gonna talk about Ukraine, as if anybody in this country or anywhere else has been talking about anything else uh, recently. Uh, but we've been hearing a very one-sided uh, narrative of what is going on in Ukraine. Um, and so we want to have a discussion that hopefully can um, fill out that picture, bring a full, fuller picture of the situation um, uh, in Ukraine. And um, my uh, co-host is Margaret Flowers. And uh, she is the director of Popular Resistance. And I'm sure at one point she will put in the, the uh, um, URL of her website so you can see that. Uh, wonderful articles on uh, the political situation in the United States and around the world and Popular Resistance. Uh, she's also on the administrative committee of United National Anti-War Coalition. And um, our uh, main person today that we will be discussing with is Scott Ritter. Um, uh, I've known Scott for a number of years. Uh, he lives close by from, to where I live. And in the beginning of the Iraq war, uh, locally in uh, where we live, we, um, uh, I helped form a group called Bethlehem Neighbors for Peace which actually hosted the original conference that uh, formed UNAC nationally. Um, uh, one of the things we did was we quickly recognized that uh, a very important voice uh, uh, discussing what was going on in Iraq uh, lived in our community. It was Scott Ritter. Um, uh, Scott was a, um, a chief weapons inspector in I Iraq uh, and he decided to tell the truth um, when the president of the United States and others were saying there were weapons of mass destruction in uh, Iraq and that was the excuse for our invasion and war. Uh, Scott who was there on the ground and investigating this said we have found no weapons of mass destruction. Uh, that put him on the outs a little bit with the powers that be, um, but it uh, put him in good stead with our local anti-war group, Bethlehem Neighbors for Peace. Uh, we called a big meeting in our town hall. It was filled to the brim. Uh, every chair and every wall space and floor space was filled up, and we had a wonderful meeting to discuss um, uh, the situation in Iraq. And it really helped launch uh, Bethlehem Neighbors for Peace, which really helped launch uh, United National Anti-War Coalition, UNAC. Well, today, Scott is doing the same thing. He's looking with an honest person's eye at what is going on in um, Ukraine, which is a very different war. And I think he will explain some of this uh, than the Iraq war. Um, and he's telling the truth. It's very, very difficult to do. Those of us that are doing it have to be very careful. We are censored in a lot of the social media. Scott will talk a little bit about that today too, I'm sure. Um, and, um, uh, and only one side is getting out. 
Uh, it's very, very difficult because all the Russian media has um, been stopped in the United States and media of other countries that have a different narrative than the United States has been stopped in the United States. Um, and really to get some information of what is being said on Russian media, what is being said by some people on the ground that you don't hear in the US media, you've got to go onto other kinds of platforms like Telegram, which is a, um, a platform that's uh, um, encrypted so people can't tell information. And we're seeing other voices there. And some of that is starting to get out a little bit in the United States. So. With that, I'm going to introduce Margaret, who will uh, introduce the uh, first question to Scott and may say a couple of words. Margaret, uh, you're, you're up. Great. Thank you so much, Joe. And welcome, Scott. Welcome, everyone who's made it to the webinar tonight. It's really great to see you. And uh, the fact that you're here is, is just so important because, as Joe said, there's so much misinformation going on right now about what's happening with Ukraine and what's happening is really, you know, um, it's an example of kind of where we are right now in the world in so many facets in the militarization and the climate crisis, economic crises that we're facing and uh, really the culmination of, of, you know, years, as you'll hear, of uh, planning that's gone into bringing us to where we are today but it's you know it has such implications globally it's really changing feels like it's changing everything and also putting us at great risk at the same time so it's so important that we get accurate information we're so grateful to people like scott who are able to provide that who has such a wealth of experience and uh, can provide us with that information so that we can share it out more broadly and try to cut through the lies that are being told to push us into a, a major and very dangerous conflict. So I'm gonna stop there because I know we really wanna hear from Scott, but I just thought, you know, Joe and I have a number of kind of areas that we wanna concentrate on tonight. But before we get to that, Scott, I thought if you could just kind of give your feelings like where we are right now today, what's happening right now and kind of, uh, you know, anything that you wanna share about that. Well, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll start by, you know, it, it better the, the best way to judge where we're at today is to understand where we came from. Um, back in the 1980s, uh, we had a Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union. I mean, the United States led alliance called NATO, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, uh, fronting, uh, confronting the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact. Uh, and the, the line of uh, confrontation basically ran through Germany, West Germany, East Germany, both occupied at the end of the Second World War. Um, and this was a very dangerous situation, especially in the, in the early to mid 1980s when uh, the Soviet Union and the United States began introducing what we call intermediate nuclear forces. Um, these are missiles that uh, you know, have a range of say 500 to 5,000 miles, uh, but what made them especially dangerous was for instance, in the Soviet case, the SS-20 had three warheads and they had hundreds of these missiles so if there was going to be a war in Europe, every single major European city would be destroyed. And I just want to say that one more time so it sinks in. Every single major European city in Europe will be destroyed if there was a war. The United States responded by deploying its own missiles, a, a cruise missile, Tomahawk, and then the, um, or the ground launch cruise missile, and then the, um, the Pershing II. And the thing about the Pershing II is that once it was launched from its base in Germany, it could hit Moscow uh, in seven to 10 minutes, meaning that there's no time for anybody to make a decision, uh, no, no time to think. If a launch was detected, you're gonna hit the button and fire everything, which means not just every single major city in Europe, but every single major city in the United States would have been evaporated within 45 minutes. The world ends. This wasn't a joke, ladies and gentlemen, this was real. We lived it 24 seven. I was raised in Germany. We lived in a German village next to a nuclear weapons depot. If there was a war, that would be one of the first targets hit. So every morning as a child, I woke up wondering if I was gonna get the 200,000 degree suntan, which is basically what happens when a nuclear bomb goes off and the, the heat flash hits you. That's the reality we lived in. The United States and the Soviet Union, or what we call Russia today, on the cusp of a war 
that could terminate life as we know it in the world. Now, the Cold War ended. It didn't just end on its own. One of the things I did as a Marine um, was not only trained to kill the Soviets, I was pretty proficient in what we call combined arms warfare, maneuver warfare, uh, but I also was the first inspector sent to the Soviet Union in 1988 to implement the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty that got rid of those missiles I was telling you about. So there was a recognition on the part of the United States and the Soviet Union that these missiles represented a, a, an existential threat to the survival of the world, and they agreed to get rid of them. We did this. And because of that, we developed this trust that led to you know, a reduction of tension. And then the Soviet Union fell, the Warsaw Pact went away, and one would have thought that this was a perfect opportunity for a framework of peace to break out all over Europe. But the United States and the Europeans decided to keep NATO in place. Um, and, 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 and NATO transformed into something that um, it wasn't in, originally envisioned to be. It was originally envisioned to be a defensive organization, a defensive alliance, and then became uh, an alliance that now had European security as its mission, and that included offensive military action. We saw that in 1999 against the Serbs. Uh, we saw that in 2011 against the Libyans, and on and on and on. So the situation we find ourselves in today is instead of the world being a safer place after going through this horrific period of time in the 1980s, it's like we've gone back in time. It's like a Michael J. Fox movie. You know, we got in our DeLorean and we went too fast and poof, we're back in time. Because once again, we have NATO facing off against a, a Russian military uh, capability. And now the United States having withdrawn from the INF Treaty uh, in 2019, is talking about sending intermediate nuclear missiles back to Europe to recreate the exact same situation that we got rid of in the 1980s. Um, and, and now what's worse is that in, in the Cold War, it was called a Cold War because we never really got into a shooting match. Today we have a hot war. Today we have an actual large-scale ground combat going on in the, 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 the largest European country, Ukraine. Uh, and it's a war that has already invoked the specter of nuclear weapons, with Russia saying that if NATO interferes, that represents an existential threat, and Russia may have to use nuclear weapons in response. So now NATO, for the first time, is talking about what its nuclear strike policy is. So we have two sides actively preparing for nuclear war as we speak. Ladies and gentlemen, the stakes couldn't get any higher than this. And therefore, you have to ask yourself, why is this happening? Did Russia wake up one morning and say, I want to invade Ukraine. I just want to destabilize the world and, and go for it. Or has Russia been reacting to the failure of NATO to dissolve itself at the end of the Cold War and instead expand itself eastward in a manner that Russia viewed as a threat? And this isn't a threat that Russia only recently talked about. We know that Russia has raised the expansion of NATO continuously since the 1990s. Uh, the National Security Archives has the, 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 the audio tapes of the phone calls from President Clinton and then President Yeltsin, where Yeltsin is begging Clinton not to expand NATO. This puts me in a bad light, he said. This is an embarrassment. I lose face with my people. And Clinton said, sorry, we're expanding NATO. Anyways, Vladimir Putin, when he became president, said, hey, rather than just expanding NATO, why don't you invite me in? <laughs> and that way we don't have to worry about it. We'll make it one big happy club. And the United States wouldn't do it because NATO's purpose was to contain Russia, not absorb Russia. Uh, this, 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 this expansion of NATO has been viewed by Russia as a threat. We know this in 2007, Putin spoke at the Munich Security Conference, gave an outstanding speech, one of the best uh, examples of political, modern political rhetoric anywhere. Anywhere. I advise everybody to go and watch it. It is a brilliant speech. And he articulates forcefully and eloquently the Russian position. No one can say we don't know what the Russian position was. There it is, <laughs> spoken by the president himself. Um, one of the things he said is they, that this expansion of NATO represents an existential threat. It's a red line. How do we know this? William uh, Burns, you might, remember, you might know that name right now. He's currently the director of the CIA. At the time, in 2008, he was the U.S. ambassador to Russia. He wrote a memorandum called Nyet means Nyet. No means no articulating what the Russian position was in regards to NATO expansion. He said it's a red line and the Russians mean it. They view this as an existential threat. 
If you continue to expand NATO, and here's the important thing. And he wrote this in February 2009. If you continue to push for the expansion of NATO, Russia will have no choice but to invade Ukraine, and Ukraine will lose at a minimum the Crimea and the Donbass. He predicted the future. I make guess maybe that's why he's the director of the CIA today. But he predicted the future accurately. No one can say we didn't know. We knew, and yet we continued to do this. And we pushed Russia into a corner until last December. They said enough is enough. They sent two draft treaties demanding a restructuring of the European security framework, and they demanded uh, Ukraine opt out of NATO, become neutral. They said, we're not joking. Take this seriously. If you don't take this seriously, we will have no choice but to undertake what they call the military technical option. They weren't taken seriously. The United States and Europe ignored them, belittled them, mocked them. And now we have what we have because the Russians don't bluff. That's lesson number one out of this whole thing is the Russians don't bluff. So as you evaluate what's going on, you hear a lot of spin out there about what's happening, the Russian, this, Russian, that. Take the Russians at face value. When they say they're going to do something, they're going to do something exactly the way they said they're going to do it. So that's where we are today. We have a major war ongoing in Ukraine, one that, by the way, Russia is winning decisively. I'm not here to promote war. You know, this is an anti-war um, group, but we're here to talk about the facts. And the fact is Russia is winning this war decisively. We can go through the metrics all you want. Uh, you know, I have a, a, a huge amount of experience in this. I've been studying military math all my life. And I'm telling you right now, whatever metric you put up there, Russia has won this war hands down. And they're in the process of, I believe, wrapping up one of the most stunning military victories in modern history. But you won't, you won't hear about that because our media is spinning it the exact opposite. And maybe we can talk about why that is at a later date, but that's that's where we are today. I hope that wasn't too long of an answer. Great, thank you very much, uh, Scott. Um, I, I forgot to mention in Scott's introduction uh, his extensive military career and military experience, and I think we heard uh, some of that um, just now. Um, my question was going to be about the reasons for war, but. You asked a lot of that. You answered a lot of that. Uh, we, we hear on the media here, again, that it was totally unprovoked. We don't hear about the expansion of NATO and the kinds of things that you said. But there's another aspect of it, maybe you could talk about it, is uh, as far as the United States is concerned, the war started in February. But as far as the people of Ukraine are concerned, it started in 2014, and there's been an ongoing war in the Donbass, which um, thousands of people have been killed. I'm wondering if you would like to mention anything uh, about that, Scott. Sure. Well, I think and I'm a historian by, by training, so I always go back to the, to the beginning, <laughs> because I, I don't like to start in the middle of a story because you miss the context. Um, the beginning. The beginning actually goes back to World War II, um, uh, prior to World War II, you know, the, ribbon, uh, the Molotov, Ribbentrop, 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 German name, <laughs> yeah, that basically divided Poland up in 1939 between Germany and the, um, and the, and the, and the Soviet Union. Um, because of this, this pact, the way Poland was divided, uh, Eastern Poland became Western Ukraine. And, um, and so it was this artificial entity that was lobbed onto uh, Western Ukraine and the population of Eastern Poland, also it, it's known in history as Galatia, uh, has been very resentful of the Soviet, of Soviet rule. And when the Soviet, when the Ru Germans invaded uh, the Soviet Union in June of 1941, they were actually welcomed as liberators by the, the population of Western Ukraine. Uh, almost overnight, 80,000 of these Ukrainian, Western Ukrainian Eastern Poles immediately joined the German military as part of the Waffen SS. Um, and so they, they began to express their militancy in the, in, in the form of one of the most odious Nazi organizations imaginable, the Waffen SS, the military arm of, um, of the Nazi party. Uh, and they fought for, um, for, for, the, for the Germans. And they didn't just fight, they murdered. 
Um, they committed atrocities against the Poles. They committed atrocities against the Russians. They committed atrocities against the Jews. Uh, a lot of people will, will hear of the Babi Yar massacre that uh, took place in Kiev. Over 30,000 Jews shot down over the course of several days. Uh, it may have been directed by the Germans, but the trigger men were Ukrainians. These Western Ukrainians that joined the, 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 the SS. Um, this, the, they had a guy named Stepan Bandera. Stepan Bandera is their leader. He was their leader beforehand. He uh, basically joined the, the, the German cause. Um, they, they'll claim as a Ukrainian nationalist that he joined not because he supported Hitler, but because he was against Stalin. But he wore a German uniform and his men worked for the Waffen-SS and they killed Jews. So to me, there's no distinguishing the, the two. But in 1944, as Germany began to lose the war, um, the, the, the Bandera movement uh, broke away from the Germans. It began a, an act of resistance against the, 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 the Soviets. And we're talking large scale resistance. I'll show you how large it was from 1944 until 1954. Uh, this resistance killed over, over 300,000 Ukrainians lost their lives because of this resistance. 36,000 Soviet security forces and, and Red Army soldiers lost their lives. This is a major war. For going on for a decade. And what makes this major war uh, important is that many of the Ukrainians were controlled by a German intelligence organization, I think it's called the 12th Department, headed by uh, a German general named Galen. Um, when the war ended, the United States, rather than arresting Galen and prosecuting him for war crimes, instead brought in his entire organization, called it the Galen Organization, and subordinated it to the CIA so that it can continue running operations in the Soviet Union. And from 1945 until 1955, the CIA funded this Ukrainian opposition, trained it, sent it weapons, organized it. In 1955, they basically were defeated, um, but the CIA didn't walk away. From 1955 until 1990, the CIA continued to fund and support and nurture this Bandera movement um, as part of their, uh, their propaganda effort. They kept them alive, kept the ideology alive as part of their anti-Soviet activity. This funding only stopped in 1990, but the reason, reason why I bring it up is that when we talk about 2014, we're, we talk about the empowerment of the Bandera movement um, from a small um, you know, right-wing um, you know, ideology that had a limited political um, impact into this major player in, in Ukraine. And, and some people say, well, how could you have known? How could you have known this was gonna happen? How could you have known the CIA built it, nurtured it, grew it, owned it, controlled it? Um, it wasn't a secret to the United States. So we knew exactly what we were doing when we breathed life into this militant movement in 2014. You know, we supported these color revolutions. 2004, there was a color revolution, the orange revolution that throughout old Soviet rule brought in new quote unquote democracy. There's never been a democracy in Ukraine. Ukraine is one of the most corrupt nations on the planet. Everybody talks about Russian oligarchs. The Ukrainians have more oligarchs per capita than the Russians do, and their oligarchs actually control the politics. How did Zelensky become president? Zelensky was a comedian working for a channel owned by an oligarch who decided, I wanna make you president. Zelensky didn't wake up one day and go, I want to be president. He played one on TV, a very popular comedy, I think, called Servant of the People. I've watched it. Funny as heck. Really good show. You should watch it. Um, but it's not reality. It's fiction. But it, it, it's like if Americans were watching West Wing and decided to elect Martin Sheen as president because he played one on TV. Martin Sheen has no qualification to be president of the United States. But he played one on TV, so we're gonna we're gonna make him president. Well, that's what the Ukrainians did because the state of their politics is so horrible. But going back to 2014, there was a pro-Russian uh, president named uh, Viktor Yanukovych who was struggling with a major economic problem. Uh, the majority of Ukrainians wanted to be aligned with the European Union economically. I think they saw that their future, uh, their best economic future, was through Europe, not through Moscow. The problem is the conditions that the European Union were, were in, seeking to impose were prohibitive. Uh, and it would have required actually Russia to pay for 
Ukraine to become an EU member. And Putin met with, uh, with, with, with Yanukovych and said, look, I don't care if you join the EU. I'm just not going to pay for it. <laughs> Russia's not paying for it. So if you want to join, join. But if you can't afford it, then you got to come in and, and work with me. And so Yanukovych thought about it and said, okay, we can't afford it. I'm going to Russia. Well, the people rose up. There was, there was um, you know, demonstration street, peaceful demonstrations, by the way, very peaceful demonstrations, the legitimate expression of democracy. I don't think anybody had a problem. Yanukovych didn't have a problem with these demonstrations. He understood where they were coming from. But then what happens is the United States and the European Union come in and say, there's a weakness here. We can solve this problem by orchestrating a coup d'etat that will eliminate Yanukovych and we can bring in our own people. And these are people that the United States government had identified early on and we had been training them actively. How do we know this? Because Victoria Nuland, who is the State Department official responsible for that part of the world, has been intercepted with a phone call a famous phone call where she told the European Union something um, <laughs> that we can't say on, on, on polite panels. But, um, but she also talked about um, our boy Yats. Yats, of course, is short for uh, the name of a, a man who eventually became the prime minister of, uh, of Ukraine. We handpicked this guy. We handpicked the government. We were talking about Yats competing with Klesko and all this stuff and who's going to be the best person. We're making the decisions. And... This is a coup d'etat. Now, the peaceful demonstrators can't get rid of Yanukovych. So we brought in the people we know. We brought in the Bandera people. And they came in armed. They seized, uh, they, they stormed police uh, armories, took weapons, came down, and they overnight, they turned what was a peaceful demonstration in, in the Maidan Plaza into a violent revolution that killed scores of people, horrible acts of violence. I mean, again, I'm not, you know, I don't wanna to get too political here. We call what happened in January 6th of last year an insurrection of 2020, uh, yeah, 2021, I think, an insurrection. You know, the, the horrific storming of the US Capitol. I condemn it with all my heart. I view that as a gross acts of violence. That's a demonstration, God bad, but it wasn't an insurrection, ladies and gentlemen. An insurrection, they would not have voluntarily left the Capitol. An insurrection would have gotten in with guns blazing, killing every member of Congress. That's what an insurrection does. How do we know? Because there was an insurrection in the Maidan in, in February 2014. That's what an insurrection looks like. It was a U.S. orchestrated insurrection to achieve one purpose, to get rid of Viktor Yanukovych. How do we know that? Because Joe Biden called Viktor Yanukovych in person and said, you got to go. I don't mean to get angry, but come on, man. What is regime change policy? We've never had regime change policy. Why did Biden get on the phone and tell Yanukovych he has to go? That's regime change policy, literally, writ large, big letters. And he left. But now what happened? You've created this mess. You've empowered these Nazis. And they're now in charge. Now, people say, okay, but Scott, they're minorities, man. They're just, okay, yeah, they had the violence and the Maidan and all that. But at the end of the day, when they ran for parliament, they didn't get majorities in parliament. Well, you know what? Who else didn't have a majority? The Bolsheviks. You go back and study Russian history, you got these two major elements. You got the Mensheviks, which means small, and the Bolsheviks, which means big. But the Mensheviks are actually big, and the Bolsheviks are actually small. Why did the Bolsheviks win? Because they were violent. They were violent. And so now you've empowered these Bandera worshiping neo Nazis to come in and seize power, and they're not going to let it go. They immediately intimidate the Ukrainian Rada to start passing laws that empower nationalism, Ukrainian nationalism, at the expense of Russian speaking Ukrainians and ethnic Russians. They outlaw the language, they outlaw the culture, and then they violently seek to impose their will. They go down to Odessa city on the coast. There's a riot there after a soccer game. They, they throw 150 pro-Russian demonstrators into the House of Culture, then set it on fire. Over 40 people die. The Russians are enraged. The Ukrainians start to make a move towards Crimea, and the Russian government says, not so fast. They send in the little green men, and Russia takes control of Crimea, blocking them. But where do the Nazis go from there? They head straight to the Donbass. They start assaulting the Russian population there. The Russians rose up. They declared independence. A curious fact. 
Vladimir Putin didn't recognize them as independent states. He rejected that. He said, no, you're part of, of Ukraine. We have to respect the, the, the territorial sovereignty of Ukraine, but we will support you in your effort to defend your rights. And so thus began the Ukrainian civil war in the Donbass, where the Ukrainian army, uh, backed by these neo-Nazi military units, <laughs> trying to forcefully impose themselves on a Russian population that rejects being manhandled by the Ukrainians. They form independent militias that are supported by the Russians. And now we have a war, a civil war. And it's a horrible war. It breaks down into front lines. And, and here's the nature of the fighting. Victor Poroshenko, uh, one, you know, a, a president that came in um, after the series, he's the president before Zelensky, gave a speech. And he says, let me tell you what's going to happen. He's talking to the people of Donbass. Our kids, meaning Ukrainian kids, are going to go to kindergarten. Then they're going to go to store and they're going to go to the park and they're going to have a normal life. Your kids are going to be cowering in the basements while we shell you every single day. You want to know why the Russians are mad? Because that's the life that these Russians were subjected to. 14,000 people lost their lives in the course of eight years. Nonstop violence. It could have come to an end. In 2015, uh, so, uh, something called the Normandy Format, that was the, uh, the Germans, the French, the Ukrainian government got together with the Russians there as observers, and they agreed to a ceasefire uh, that the, and keeping the Donbass in Ukraine, but that the legislation of Ukraine would pass a series of laws that gave sort of a special autonomous status to the Russians so that they wouldn't be impacted by the anti-Russian laws that had been passed. A very reasonable thing. But when Poroshenko tried to implement it, these neo-Nazis, remember this minority, told him, if you do that, we will kill you. Again, we're talking about what, what the definition of an insurrection is. Imagine somebody telling Joe Biden, if you sign that legislation, I'm going to kill you. The Secret Service would be all over that person. That would be the last you ever heard of him. Rightfully so. But here the Nazi says, you sign it, you die. So guess what happens? He doesn't sign it. Zelensky comes in on a, you know, on a platform of peace, and he wants to implement Minsk. But he was told, not just told, they made a videotape of this where the guy basically says to the videotape, if he signs it, he'll be hanging by the neck until dead on some major Kiev thoroughway. And it's the truth. If Zelensky signed it, he'd be hanging by the neck until dead. Who runs Ukraine? It's not Zelensky. It's not the parliament. It's the Nazis. And if you're a Russian, and I'm going to leave it with this, because this is, an, this is the emotional part. You thought losing 14,000 people was emotional? I'm going to give you what emotional is. Emotional is losing 23 to 32 million people in a war against Nazi Germany. That is what defines Russia today. Every major town, every major city has a monument to the people who died. Every family lost people, one, two, three, four, five, a dozen, 20 in that war. The biggest holiday in Russia is May 9th, Victory Day. It's not like in America. When was the last time the United States celebrated Victory in Europe Day? Never, not in our memory. We forgot about it. We don't have any more World War II veterans. They're all dead or dying. But the Russians, they're dead and dying too. You know how they remember it? They form something called the Immortal Regiment. So the family members of those veterans carry the portraits of the people who fought in that war, and they parade by the tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands every May 9th in remembrance of this. It's in their DNA. And now you're asking them to sit back and watch the Nazi ideology come to life in Ukraine and do nothing about it? And Amer I'm sick and tired of hearing Americans saying denazification, which is one of the military objectives set forth by Vladimir Putin. It's a myth. It's a joke. It's nothing. You know, it's, Scott, excuse. it's as yeah. real as it gets, man. It's as real as it gets. Yeah. You know, Scott, I was in, in Ukraine a couple of times in the last couple of years. Last time I was there, it was around May 9th. It was on, on May 2nd um, that, to be with the people in Odessa who were uh, the family members of the, of, of the people that were killed by the Nazis at, at the House of Trade Unions. And in Ukraine, they stopped um, celebrating Victory Day. Um, it, it's no longer celebrated, but it is celebrated by the people. They come out anyway, and they're intimidated by the Nazis when they do, and they continue to come out. 
And just a couple of other things on what you said. You know, Bandera has been named a hero of the country in Ukraine. That's that's the status he is right, right now. And I want to say one other thing about uh, Ukraine. And one of the leaders of the massacre you mentioned in Kiev, uh, where 33,000 uh, Jews were, were killed there, while the Nazis was there, uh, was allowed into the United States after World War II. And um, right up near where I live, near where you live, about an hour south of, of Albany, he started a camp, um, uh, which is a summer camp for Ukrainians. And they have statues there of what they call the heroes, including Bandera statues and the other collaborators. And they meet there once a year. They wear the uniforms of the Nazi collaborators of the organization of uh, of Ukrainian nationalists, and they celebrate uh, some of these people. So this is going on very seriously there and also here. Uh, but I want to get on to more of the military situation that's going on right now, the humanitarian situation, talk about um, uh, Bucha, uh, Before we economic do that situations, and I'd like to turn it over to Margaret to get into that. <laughs> well, actually, I... I... You know, there's so much to unpack here. And, and before yeah. we move on to the humanitarian situation, which is really important, um, Scott, you've been doing a lot of, of good writing about the legality of this. And, you know, one of the things that I don't hear mentioned um, is, you know, leading up to, I mean, Russia started really a massive evacuation of uh, of Russian people in the Donbass region on February 18th as the you know, the Ukraine military, the Azov Battalion, started escalating their violations of the ceasefire agreement, the Minsk Accord, tr dramatically. And, and of course, that's when the Duma, you know, I guess, passed a resolution asking to, to um, recognize Donetsk and Lugansk. And, and then the leaders of those regions are, you know, asking for help. So I, I think that's something if you could comment on why it became so critical on February 24th that Russia began this military intervention. Um, but then as well as that, more on the legitimate uh, security concerns of Russia considering Article 4 of NATO. And so if you could talk about both of those. Okay, well, let's, again, um, in the World War II, the United Nations was formed and um, one of the goals of the UN was to ban war. Uh, I think uh, the Nuremberg, Nuremberg Military Tribunal um, had uh, come to an agreement that the greatest war crime of all was the uh, was a war of aggression, because from the war of aggression, all other war crimes emerge. And so the idea was, how do we stop wars of aggression? They just banned it outright, illegal. There's two there's two exceptions to this. One is a chapter seven resolution passed under by the Security Council of the United Nations. And that is when the Security Council determines that a situation has occurred that threatens international peace and security and the welfare of nations, that it can authorize UN member nations to use military force to rectify that situation. Um, the most recent example of a chapter seven war was Operation Desert Storm back in 1990, 1991, 1991 Desert Storm, Desert Shields, 1990, in response to Saddam Hussein's invasion and occupation of Kuwait. Uh, again, I'm not here to you know, say good, bad, whatever. I'm just talking about the law right now. Um, and the law said, uh, when, when he invaded Kuwait, the Security Council met and said, we're authorizing the use of military force. And military force was used to achieve the liberation of Kuwait. That is a lawful war. Doesn't make it a just war, doesn't make it a good war, just a lawful war. Um, the other way that uh, force is, is through Article 51. Article 51 allows for legitimate self-defense, uh, either in terms of an individual nation or collective self-defense. And that's an important notion right now, collective self-defense. That's going to come into play. So basically, if you're attacked, you have the inherent right of self-defense. But now we come to uh, 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 one of the, the questions that, that emerged, and it, it actually comes from a period in, uh, in American history, actually, 1837. There was a U.S. ship called the Caroline operating up by the Canadian border, and the Caroline was providing weapons and manpower, was smuggling weapons and material support to some Canadian rebels that were fighting the British Army. And the British Army knew that the ship was coming in, so the British Army attacked it. So the British 
Army, a British Navy attacked a U.S. vessel, uh, which is an act of aggression, unprovoked, they would say. But the British made the claim of the need of preemption based upon the imminent threat posed by the Caroline to the security of the British. So the concept of preemptive self-defense was born. And actually the Caroline affair, the Caroline case is quoted to this day as one of the bedrock, um, you know, the legal precedents for the doctrine of preemption. And preemption is basically, if you're, if somebody's sitting there, you know, bandaging their fist, getting their fist ready, telling you they're gonna punch you, lifting weights, getting that big old arm up, and then they're ready to go. And you say, well, I'm not gonna wait and just get punched. Pop, I'm gonna hit them first. You preempted the attack. And that is legitimate self-defense. If there is a genuine imminent threat, they can't be resolved by, for instance, going to the Security Council and asking for help. If you feel that you have to act now and a failure to act now would put you at an existential threat, you can preempt. People have tried to use preemption. The United States tried to use this doctrine of preemption to justify the 2003 invasion of Iraq. It was all a lie. You can't preempt based on a lie. You can't manufacture a case on weapons of mass destruction and the nexus they form with al-Qaeda terrorism when there are no weapons of mass destruction and there is no nexus with al-Qaeda terrorism. So that falls apart. Now we come to Russia. Russia has articulated an Article 51 justification for its action in Ukraine. And they articulate it as a preemptive collective self-defense. Now, how, how, do, how can they do that? First of all, let's understand that you can't, Russia has no legal right to inter intervene in Ukraine if this is an internal Ukrainian dispute. Meaning that so long as the Donbass was considered to be part of Ukraine, uh, whatever the Ukrainian government is doing to the Russian speakers of, of Donbass is not Russia's affair. Russia can't intervene. They have no authority to intervene. They can go to the Security Council and ask for a chapter seven resolution to be passed, authorize intervention to resolve this, but they knew that that wasn't going to happen because Ukraine was in bed with the United States and NATO. So this is where what you, something you spoke of is very important. The two oblasts or districts of uh, the Donbass, uh, Donetsk and Lugansk, um, they passed resolutions uh, earlier declaring their independence, but Russia did not recognize their independence. What they did now, or recently in, 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 in February of, uh, of, of this year is they petitioned, they, they, they passed their own uh, legislation petitioning Russia to recognize them as an independent state. The Russians received that petition, considered that the petition, and then the Russian parliament granted that petition. Why is all this important? That's how constitutionally it has to proceed. So no one can say that this was just made up. No, the laws of the, of the two oblasts, the laws of Russia were preserved constitutional due process was seen. It was then presented to Vladimir Putin, who signed the documents recognizing the independent status of Lugansk and Donetsk. Now what has happened overnight? They're no longer an integral part of Ukraine. And so Russia now can say this poses a threat. But then there's another problem. Wait a minute. No one recognizes them but Russia. It's not like the United Nations says, oh, well, Lugansk and Donetsk, you're part of the family. So are they protected by the United Nations Charter if they're not a member? And the answer is no, except, <laughs> except here comes the, the nice little, the, the little exception here, unless they're part of a collective security arrangement with a UN member. And guess who is a UN member? Russia. So Russia now has a collective security arrangement, another treaty that was signed after the recognition of independence. And this collective security arrangement now allows Russia to intercede on behalf of these, these security partners uh, and, and, and resolve the security situation. Now, this only allows Russia to intervene in the Donbass, if we're talking about the law of war. Russia, however, took a look at the situation and said, well, wait a minute, if we go into the Donbass, the Ukrainians have massed between 60 and 100,000 heavily armed troops on the, uh, on, in, in eastern Ukraine. Um, and we have intelligence that they're getting ready to launch an attack into the Donbass to preempt our assistance. So now if we go into the Donbass without dealing with this problem, that creates an existential threat for our security operation. We need to preempt the Ukrainian assault. So now the Russians are using the doctrine of preemption as part of collective self-defense to go after the, 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 the Ukrainian buildup into eastern 
uh, uh, Donetsk, but you say, well, wait a minute, Scott, <laughs> but didn't they also come up from Crimea and come down towards Kiev? How does that fit in? Because now, if you're going after those people, now you have to shape the whole battlefield. And from the Russian perspective, it's not just about the 100,000 troops you're trying to pin down in, in the Donbass. It's about the 100,000 troops up by Kiev, it's about the 80,000 troops out in western Iraq. It's about the 60,000 troops near Odessa. If you don't do anything about them, they will be able to maneuver in support of the other Ukrainians and defeat the Russian army. So now the Russians have to enlarge the scope of their preemptive attack to pin down these forces. And that's what we saw. When we saw the Russians coming in, it may look like this massive invasion of Ukraine is taking place. But the fact is, all these other things are merely supporting attacks to shape the battlefield so Russia can accomplish the primary mission of destroying 100,000 Ukrainian troops that are positioned opposite the Donbass and liberate the Donbass region. And um, what I just articulated right now, if I gave this presentation in law school, um, I would probably get a B plus, but it is a cognizable articulation of a legitimate Article 51 claim under collective self-defense. Uh, the United States may try to disagree with it, but the problem with that is that the United States was part of a similar Article 51 collective self-defense argument put forward in 1999 when NATO bombed Serbia. It's the exact same thing. It was good for us then. All Russia's done is take that page, make it better, and put it out there. It's the same argument, the same case, and the same legitimacy, even more so because everything Russia has said about the threat from the Ukrainian army is true. Everything the NATO used to justify their preemption, for instance, the concept of, of the Serbians committing genocide against the Kosovar Albanians was a lie. Uh, whatever deaths were occurring is because the CIA was working with the Kosovo Liberation Army to create uh, uh, incidents that provoked fighting with the Serbians, which was then called genocide. Uh, it's just like the case, remember, we talked about the United States invading Iraq, and you can't get legitimacy off of making up a case about WMD. Well, you can't get legitimacy about making up a case about uh, you know, Serbian genocide. Nothing we're talking about with the Russians is made up. The, the harm that was befalling the, uh, the people of Donbass, the 14,000 dead, the buildup of Ukrainian military power, all of it is real, and all of it can represent an imminent threat to security that justifies preemptive self-defense and a collective security arrangement. Remember to unmute yourself, Joe. Uh, we've been going on for a while, so let's try to get to some other things because there's some really important issues that I think we need to discuss now. One of them is the humanitarian situation. Um, uh, th there's been a lot of discussion the last couple of days of what happened in Bucha, for instance, and uh, I think we need to talk uh, about that. What we don't hear, and I just want to also throw this in, is the humanitarian um, situation on the other side. What happened in Donbass, the, the 14,000 that have been killed, the continual bombing of residential areas, um, also, what's been going on in Maripol and other other places? Someone put in the chat um, the uh, um, uh, URL for Patrick Lancaster, who's an American in in um, uh, Maripol. And I just listened to one of his broadcasts today. He was just going and interviewing people, um, uh, and they were saying how the Russians were their liberators. But we don't hear that. Um, here and how the Ukrainians were shooting at them and, and killing them and not letting them leave the area. And it was them that was attacking them during these humanitarian corridors. And we hear of the vast numbers of people who have been leaving the country, which is very interesting because um, it became very difficult for people to leave the country of Iraq during the Iraq war. We used to bomb them when they tried to leave. Um, and, you know, Russians, we haven't seen bombing the cities in massive ways like Kiev, like we did with weapons of mass destruction and killed massive numbers in a very, very short period of time with Iraq. But the other aspect is there's refugees that have gone to Russia, probably over a million now since 2014, uh, to escape the fighting, and we don't hear any of that. So maybe you can comment on Bucha and 
the humanitarian situations in general, and um, and then um, uh, get Margaret to to ask some more questions. <laughs> well, it's, it's, I know I got to be careful not to go too long because I know we're running out of time. But context is everything. Uh, in 1991, I was one of the planners and implementers of Operation Desert Storm. Operation Desert Storm was a major military operation against the Iraqis. It kicked off with a, uh, I believe, a 44-day um, uh, strategic air campaign. Um, we started off that air campaign by blowing up every means of communication, meaning we shut down the radios, we shut down the TVs, we shut down everything. We blew up all the bridges, we blew up all the highways, we blew up everything. Electrical generation plants, uh, petroleum plants, fuel, and this went on for 44 days. Um, and we slaughtered the Iraqi people, slaughtered them. It's not a, it's not a violation of the war. Everything we bombed was a legitimate military target, but the point is, um, we killed a lot of Iraqi civilians. Now, the reason why I bring that in is Russia engaged in a major military campaign against Ukraine. You know what they didn't do? They didn't shut down cell phone service. They didn't shut down internet connectivity. They didn't shut down the railroads. They didn't shut down the highways. Uh, they let the Ukrainian people travel to and fro here and there. They allowed the president of Ukraine to get on video conferences with the United States Congress, with British Parliament, with the European Union, with NATO, video conferences that not only elevated his status as a leader, but generated billions of dollars of military aid that then flowed in, was turned over to the Ukrainian army and killed Russian soldiers. So the military imperative, the military necessity of shutting this down is real, but Russia didn't do it. Why? because Russia isn't viewing this as a war like we viewed the war against the Iraqis. Russia is viewing this as a special military operation. People make fun of that word, but it's not war because if it was war, Ukraine would be gone today, eliminated. You wouldn't recognize it. Unfortunately, it's getting that way because the, the way the Ukrainians have opted to defend means they're putting their military forces in residential areas and those areas are getting bombed and destroyed and people are dying. But the original Russian approach was a very soft approach. They didn't use Russian doctrine of overwhelming military fi uh, firepower, artillery that flattens everything, followed by a massed tank attack that runs over everything. That's not what they did. They actually came in with light infantry units up front who tried to negotiate their way through the towns and cities, meet with the elected officials and say, we're not a threat. Let's let us go through and do our job. We won't bother you. You can continue to govern the way you want to govern. I believe the Russians were told by their intelligence professionals that they would be received, well received. Um, the rumors are that Putin has arrested several of these intelligence officials because they got it wrong. Uh, and the Russians weren't well received. And the Russians lost a lot of men up front trying to come in soft. But the point is the Russians have never changed their position, which is they are there not to defeat the Ukrainian people, but to defeat Nazis, to demilitarize, and to bring minimal harm. And we have written orders to this effect. Now, unfortunately, there's been fighting. And, um, and, 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 and we see, you know, there are civilian casualties and there are refugees. Uh, that is just one of the horrific realities of war, which is why the United Nations sought to ban war to begin with. And everybody should ensure that the last option is always uh, military action, that we exhaust every venue short of war before we go to war, because war is horrible. War is awful. You don't want to glamorize war. You don't want to legitimize war. But it's happening right now. And we need to understand that the Russians have done everything humanly possible to minimize the damage that's been done to the Ukrainian civilians and Ukrainian civilian infrastructure. We see the Russian concern when you talked about it, Joe, about how before the war started, they began the evacuation of civilian populations out of the war zone, which is one of the things you are required to do under the international humanitarian law that if you are gonna wage conflict in an area where there are civilian structures, you have a duty and responsibility to get the civilians the hell out of there before the fighting starts. Because if you don't, then you're using them as de facto human shields. Well, guess who hasn't evacuated the civilians? The Ukrainians. And now we come to the opposite end. The Russians have gone out of their way to treat Ukrainian civilians with respect. What have we learned about the Ukrainian nationalists, the Nazis? They view anybody who collaborates with the Russians, 
any one of these mayors who said, yeah, come on in, keep going, uh, we're not going to harass you, uh, they are now collaborators who will be killed. And they are being killed. They're being arrested and assassinated by the Ukrainian government for the crime of collaboration. They're doing the same thing with people who receive Russian humanitarian uh, aid. The Russians hand out these uh, aid packets and they're in little green boxes. They have a white star. You may have seen them. They say volume toward military store, uh, but they hand them out their dry rations and they, and they give them to people who are hungry, who are starving. Um, it is a crime to possess one of these. If you possess one of these and the Ukrainian National Police catch you, you are treated as a collaborator and you are killed. And this becomes important when we start talking about Bucha in a minute. But you know, as this war goes on, too, we're, we're seeing another thing, the displacement of people. People tend to run away from combat zones because most people are rational thinking people and they don't want to be around where shells are going up. So they flee and they try to flee out of the combat zone, which means now millions of people are fleeing into Europe, into Poland, into Hungary, into uh, Slovakia, into um, uh, uh, Romania, Moldova. Uh, they're, they're fleeing there, and this creates a crisis of its own. And you talked about Article 4. You know, one of the, 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 the big things about NATO, people talk about collective defense, an attack against one is an attack against all. That's Article 5. It's only being invoked once right after 9-11 and pretty much what was a propaganda show by the United States to show that the world was lined up behind it. Uh, they flew some airplanes over the United States uh, for a, you know, a airborne warning, uh, as if the terrorists were gonna hijack even more aircraft. And, and they sailed some ships in the Mediterranean, but it wasn't real. But NATO has been at war many times. The other article that authorized NATO to go to war is Article 4. And that's basically where the members can consult with one another on matters of uh, imminent security concern of one or more members. Uh, they've used that excuse to take on Serbia, to go into Libya, to go into Iraq after the invasion, to go into Afghanistan. Um, and today they've convened Article 4. Uh, Poland and the Baltic nations have convened an Article 4 uh, con uh, consultation, and they're talking about what can we do in Ukraine. NATO recognizes that if they send military troops into Ukraine, uh, they lose Article 5 protection. Uh, so meaning that if Russia responds, you can't gin up the whole NATO uh, group under Article 5, but you can gin them up under Article 4. And that's the danger. Right now, there's active discussions in NATO about creating a humanitarian buffer in Western Ukraine so that these refugee, refugees don't come into Europe proper. They're held in place in Western Ukraine, um, but they need to be protected so NATO troops will come in. Initially, people said, well, that's insane, because if we do that, the Russians are going to attack, and now we'll find ourselves where two nuclear-armed opponents are facing off against each other uh, at a time when they're both talking about using nuclear weapons. So there's been a lot of um, hesitation about getting people involved. But as this war progresses, and I believe it's going to get far worse before it gets better, there's going to be even more humanitarian pressure on Europe. Uh, in the form of this wave of refugees, and there will be more pressure on Europe to do something about it, uh, to include uh, putting um, uh, a, a buffer zone in that could lead to a force-on-force -force conflict with uh, with Russians. But now we come to Bukha. Bukha was uh, was occupied by the Russians. Um, the Russians, you know, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that uh, Russia has been perfect. Uh, my my experience in the military is no military is perfect because it's of human beings who are subjected to some of the most horrific things in the world, man killing man or woman killing man, whatever. Human killing a human in a combat situation is murder. It's organized murder of the worst sort. And it's not easy to do. It's not, it's not something, that's, and it's good that it's not easy to do, but when you get into a combat mode, and I speak a personal experience, you dehumanize the enemy because you go insane if you viewed them as human beings. So you dehumanize them to the point that you can kill them without thinking, without remorse. And if you're gonna, if the second you lose that edge, you die because the other guy hasn't. He's killing. He's going to kill you. And when you get that way, you need discipline and you need leadership to be watching your men and women very closely to make sure they don't go over the edge. And it's tough. I mean, uh, Michael Hare wrote a book called Dispatches about Vietnam. It's a classic book. It was quoted in uh, in uh, uh, um, Apocalypse Now. But the saying was, um, you know. Charging someone with murder in wartime is like writing speeding tickets at the Indianapolis 500. It just doesn't make any sense because war is about murder. 
Well, it's not, it's about murder of other combatants. It's not about murder of civilians. Sometimes civilians die. That's just the horrible reality of it. The modern military math is, generally speaking, in a modern conflict, for every combatant that dies, a civilian dies. So if we're in a war where 100,000 soldiers have died on both sides, you're probably going to have 100,000 dead civilians. That's just the way it works. But not in Ukraine. In Ukraine, the numbers are much higher for enemy for, for combatants killed than civilians killed. The, still, the number is still big for civilians, but the ratio is not one to one. The ratio is like seven to one. Seven combatants for every single civilian killed. Why? Because the Russians are coming in soft. Even if the even when you know, most of the civilians are dying because the Ukrainians are digging into civilian neighborhoods, forcing the Russians to blow up buildings, put down artillery barrages, etc., killing civilians. But the the numbers would be even lower if the Ukrainians obeyed the law of war. The reason why I bring this up is we're talking about mindset. We have one side that says we're trying to preserve human life, civilian life, and civilian infrastructure. We have the other side that says if you collaborate with the Russians, you will be killed. <laughs> I mean, it's written down. They've made videos. They talk about it. So now the Russians are in Bukha to withdraw, part of this withdrawal. While they were there for several re weeks, the Russian military says we had good relations with the local people. It was peaceful. We traded our dry rations for their dairy products. So they had a system of barter set up. So the, 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 the citizens of Bukha would give them eggs, milk, cheese, and the Russians would give them the dry rations, the flour, the salt, the sugar, uh, the meat, etc. cetera. Um, and this was going on. Then the Russians left. Anybody who engaged in that kind of interaction with the Russians was now viewed as a collaborator. We know this because the Ukrainian National Police have published an announcement that they are going into Bukha on April 1st to carry out a cleansing operation uh, to uh, liquidate the collaborators. All right, this is the exact opposite of the Russian approach, which is we treat everybody with respect and we try not to harm civilians. The Ukrainians are saying, if you cooperate with the Russians, you will die. They have a videotape of a senior political figure announcing uh, on social media to the citizens of Bukha, stay in your homes. The national police are carrying out a cleansing operation. Do not panic. Stay in your home. She repeats it over and over and over again. Why? Because the police are in the streets gunning people down, kicking in doors of people who are collaborating and killing them. And we know this is more than just uh, a document and a videotape because there's, I mean, a videotape of Lady Speak because we have videotape of them actually doing it. We have videotape of the Ukrainian police, especially an Azov group, uh, proudly claiming that you're going on a safari. That's an important word because when we talk about propaganda, how you take the language of one side, flip it, and use it again, you know, take your language, flip it, and use it against the other guys. It's the Ukrainians who have a special unit. The name of the Ukrainian special police unit that went into Bukha was the safari unit. And they were carrying out a safari to cleanse the pro-Russian collaborators. And cleansing means kill, not capture kill and they're doing it and then they go around and they film the dead bodies and they say the russians did it now there's a couple of things about the dead bodies one um most of them are wearing white armbands which means that they were telling the russians we're on your side <laughs> don't shoot us All right two near each body is a green dry ration box which they were carrying when they got killed, and it's on the ground next to them. Three, when they didn't have the armband, it's because the armband had been taken off and used to bind their hands behind their back. These people were murdered, murdered, not by the Russians, but by the Ukrainians. And yet that's not the spin that we're getting right now. The spin we're getting is just the opposite. All the forensic data that's available right now strongly suggests that the Ukrainians are responsible for the death these people in Bukha. There's no doubt about it. The other interesting thing is they're trying to say these bodies died. I don't want to get too graphic here, but <laughs> I've been around dead bodies. All right. You shoot a body on, on March 19th and you leave it lying in the street in 50 and 60 degree weather until April 2nd, the body ain't looking like they're looking on TV. Bodies tend to blow it up. 
this, the, the, the clothing tends to tear because the body swells and then the body bursts and it's very disgusting. It's gross. It's fetid. It's putrid. It's not what you saw on TV. What you saw on TV were freshly killed human beings. And we have another piece of evidence that more people need to pay attention to. A Mexican journalist gained access to Buka on the same day that the Ukrainians were play, declaring this. And he filmed the bodies, fresh blood. He sat there and said, these people are freshly killed. This is fresh blood. Body ain't laying there since March 19th and has fresh blood. These people were murdered on April 1st by the Ukrainian National Police. And yet we have the President of the United States coming out and saying that this is a war crime perpetrated by the Russians and Vladimir Putin needs to be brought to justice in The Hague. This is a propaganda war unlike anything we've seen in modern times, because it's not just about manufacturing a case for war. This is about an outright lie about murder, which makes us complicit in the crime, us being Americans, because that's our president who's facilitating uh, the crime. Thank you for that. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah and, and likewise in Mariupol, you know, there's, uh, People have been saying the Eitzhak Battalion took over the theater, they took over the maternity hospital, you know, that they were, there's witnesses from that region as well. But I want to get into more of, of the military situation there. You said Russia's winning. That's not what we're hearing in the, in the corporate media in the United States. Uh, recently, I guess they launched into the second phase of their operation. If you could talk a little bit about why you believe Russia's uh, winning and what they're doing right now. And we'll talk about a, a couple of things. One, we'll talk about the concept of maneuver warfare. It goes back to, the, you know, ancient Greek times. You know, the the phalanx. Uh, let's let's talk about Napoleon. Um, you know, the American Civil War in the early stages. You had lines of troops marching, and most people say, "Well, that's pretty brutal. It's line against line." But actually, if you look at it on a map, as they diagram most battles, you get to see certain things. For instance, the notion of fixing an opponent in place. If an enemy has a big concentration here, and I put a big concentration up opposite him, he can't move his troops because he's threatened by my troops. I fixed him in place. I can then do a feint. I can move troops over here in this direction, and he has to respond to that, move his own forces in that direction. That is a feint. I can then do a deception attack. That is, I can launch an attack here, maybe at odds that aren't favorable to me, but he has to respond to that by bringing in troops to, to, uh, to, 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 to respond to that. And then I can do pincers. While I've shaped the battlefield in this way, I take my other troops and I surround them. And now I can kill them all. <laughs> That's Napoleonic warfare in a nutshell. And it worked that way in World War II. We saw massive battles of, uh, of maneuver and encirclement fought throughout uh, Russia between the Germans and the Soviets uh, from 1941 up until 1945. Uh, major maneuver warfare. We saw that in the Gulf War, the war that I was involved in. We used feints, we used deception attacks, we used fixing attacks, and we used large maneuver operations, the great Hail Mary, remember, that rolled everybody up. Um, and the reason why I bring that up is this is simple military science. And you know who some of the greatest students of military science in the world are today? The Russian officer class. I mean, we treat them like they're kindergarten kids. I mean, the way we talk about them, all oh, the Russians, they don't know what they're doing. They're some of the best trained, best educated officers you'll ever meet. They know this stuff better than we do. You want to know why they know it better than we do? Because they haven't spent the last 20 years learning how to kick down doors in Iraq and murder an Iraqi family or crawl through the hills of Afghanistan and kill a goat herder, because that's what we've been doing for 20 years. We don't know how to wage large scale military war. We forgot how to do it. I used to do it for a living. I spent all my military life training to do this. Um, and even then, you know, I can't say I was perfect at it, but we, I thought I was, pretty, I was ready for it. And I proved I was during the Gulf War. But my point is, we're not ready for it today. We don't train this way. The Russians do. They think this way. So when you take a look at their map, we have a bunch of small arrow people, that's why I call the Americans, who are looking at tactical situations. They look at a videotape that shows a destroyed Russian convoy. They look at a videotape that shows three or four Russian tanks with guys sprawled out. You know what? War is hell. And when you go to war, people die, including your own. And if you're looking at small arrows, the Russians got slapped around on a couple small arrows. But now we look at the big arrows. The big arrows, what did the Russians want to do? 
I told you, they wanted to fit people in Kiev. There's 100,000 troops in Kiev that if you don't threaten them, they move down and reinforce. So you drive down from Belarus with 40,000 men and you hold 100,000 in place. You have 80,000 people in, uh, in, in, in Odessa. So you send 30,000 people from Crimea to threaten Odessa while you sail ships with Marines off the coast. And now those, eight, those troops are stuck. You have 100,000 people in the Donbass and you don't want to free them up to respond to Kiev or the other. So you fix them. You send the Donetsk and the Lugansk militias across the border in some of the most difficult fighting imaginable. And you grab onto these people and you hold them in close combat so they can't maneuver. And then you use thrust to seize a land bridge between Crimea and Russia proper so that you can freely move your forces in between. Mariupol was the key to that. Mariupol had the fall. It's the only city the Russians have fought for. Ask yourself why, because it's the only one that matters. All the other cities don't matter. You're not gonna take a city of 3.1 million Kiev with 40,000 troops, ain't gonna happen. You're not gonna take a city of 1.6 million people, Kharkiv with 50,000 troops not going to happen. But you are going to take a city of Mariupol with 50,000 troops because you're going to surround it and pound it, which is what has happened here. They, they, they've taken the town. Horrible, horrible, horrible situation. But military necessity dictated that outcome. But my point is, this, this phase that I'm talking about is called preparing the battlefield. And the other thing that's happened here is the Russians have now, they have blown up virtually all the fuel depots in, in Ukraine. I don't mean to chuckle about it, but it's important. Because what does a tank run on? Gas. What does a truck run on? Gas. What is a tank that doesn't have any gas? A coffin. What is a truck that doesn't have any gas? Another coffin. All the ammunition depots have been blown up. What's an artillery piece without ammunition? An invitation to be killed. All the water and food and, and everything that, that nurtures the troops. What's a hungry soldier and a thirsty soldier? either dead or a prisoner. So the Russians have been shaping this battle, denying maneuver to the Ukrainians while achieving their localized objectives to prepare for the major pincer operation that's gonna trap a Ukrainian force that has been starved, denied water, denied leadership, denied fuel, denied ammunition. That's phase two that's happening around. The Russians left Kiev because they don't need to fix those troops anymore. Those troops can't move because they don't have any gas. So they're stuck. And if they try to move, the Russian Air Force is going to kill them all because they have to get on a highway and they'll all die. And that's what we see. They've tried to move convoys down and the Russians take them all out. There's no reinforcement taking place. The troops that are in Donbass can't maneuver. They're trapped. And now the Russians are coming in and they're going to load, they're going to close a pincer and they're going to kill or capture the bulk of the Ukrainian army. And when that happens, there's nothing left. Nothing left. And then the Russians will be able to dictate any outcome they want. That's why I say the Russians are winning, because that's the way I see the battle. I don't misinterpret things such as, well, the Russians failed to take Kiev. The Russians never wanted to take Kiev. Well, the Russians have failed to take Odessa. They never wanted to take Odessa. These were purely diversionary actions designed to fix in place significant numbers of Ukrainian troops to keep them away from the main effort. Um, and that's why I say that the Russians are winning this war, and they're going to win this war very soon. Thank you, Scott. Um, there's a lot more that can be said about this. It was interesting today, I read that uh, there was surrender of a number of Ukrainian troops in, um, uh, in Maripol, which I thought was interesting that that's starting to happen, and we're starting to see that. Elite but, troops, I need to add. They're, they're, they're not just any... These aren't just average Ukrainian troops. These are elite. These are the Marines. Yeah. Yeah. Which means that if you have a situation where Marines are surrendering in mass, what does that tell you? They have no food. They have no ammunition. They have no fuel. They have no water. They have no hope. So if you can get elite troops to surrender, the ones that normally fight to the death, but they're surrendering now, imagine what the non-elite troops are thinking. I'd like to talk a little bit about the economic situation. Um, I know this is not your area of expertise, perhaps, but I know you've been studying a lot um, of the war situation. Uh, the U.S. mainly said we're going after Russia with sanctions. Um, U.S. has 
you know, about 42 countries in the world on sanctions, and they're all working their ways around these sanctions. It's clear that Russia prepared for this. Um, and we said the ruble was going to go through the floor. But what we're seeing now instead is the ruble is getting pretty strong. Uh, countries are starting to trade with the ruble. It's becoming more of an international currency. The dollar is weakening. We're seeing inflation in the United States. We're being hurt by the wheat that both Ukraine and, and Russia um, had, as well as um, the uh, um, lack of fuel. And more than us, uh, Europe is in terrible situation. I, I have no idea what the hell they're doing in Europe because German industry is one of the few Western countries that's still industrialized. It's going to go, it's going to die. It cannot function without, without the fuel that it's, uh, it's been um, getting. And yet they're still pushing ahead with this, I think, under the reins of, of, of the United States. So, um, and, and perhaps the outcome of this is the hegemony which the U.S. had in control of the World Bank and the IMF and the dollar being the currency for trade um, is being lost. And that hegemony is being challenged from the East uh, Russia and China, and it's clear that Russia and China have made um, uh, um, deals and were talking while the U.S. was boycotting the Olympics, doing a, a boycott. They were there talking, you know. I mean, it, it's almost foolish to think about it. What's your thoughts on this? Uh, are we going to end this war with a new economic reality throughout the world? And has this been a major mistake on the part of the United States and Europe, or where do you see this going? I'll start here rather than going all the way back. I'll, I'll just go back to February 4th of this year, okay? So that way we, rather, February 4th. What's important about February 4th is that Vladimir Putin traveled to Beijing, China, where he met with uh, the Chinese President Xi Jinping um, at the, to, to start the, the Winter Olympics. Um, this is the one that the U.S. boycotted, the West boycotted, everybody boycotted. Uh, strategic error on their part. Uh, Putin and, and, and Xi met, and they, um, their meeting produced a 5,000-plus word uh, joint statement. And this joint statement was, um, was interesting on a number of fronts. Strategically, right off the bat, the, the big item that comes out of the joint statement is that Russia and China have agreed that the rules-based international order that the United States has been selling as the end all. You hear it in every, t t even General Miley, who uh, the, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff testified before the Senate, I believe today or, or yesterday. And he, here's a military man talking about the need to defend the rules-based international order. What, what that is in short, one word is American hegemony. That's two words, so that's Marine math for you. But, uh, <laughs> American hegemony is what the rules-based international order is. It's how the America, United States dominates the world. It's the system we put in place uh, at the end of the Second World War, not only to rebuild the world, but to control the world, control the world's economy. Um, it promised not to do history, but George Kennan <laughs> wrote something called the Long Telegram uh, that was used as the, a document. Uh, he wrote it in, uh, I think, 1948, 49, 46, maybe, maybe later, but in the 40s. <laughs> and, uh, and, and he said uh, th this is a document that became famous because it became the, the foundation of Amer the American policy of containment that led to the creation of NATO and the Cold War. But Kennan wasn't writing about the military. Kennan was writing about the economy. He said that the Russians aren't buying into the American effort to impose a dollar-based economic control over the Soviet Union through the Marshall Plan and aid. The Russians rejected that. The Soviets rejected that. He said, by rejecting that, they're rejecting our control of the world scene. Therefore, we are going to be in perpetual conflict with the Soviets on economic issues. And he was right, because they're not going to surrender. They didn't surrender until 1990. Then they surrendered. We saw what happened to Russia once they surrendered. But my point is that the United States have been using this, this rules-based international order to control the world, not to help the world, to control the world to America's sole benefit. It's all about us, not about anybody else. If other people profit from it, great, but we don't care. Um, 
We want it about us. Uh, and, and, and you see this with, the, I mean, the arrogance of Joe Biden telling the German premier, the chancellor, you can't have a pipeline with Russia. You have to shut it down, even though it's going to destroy your economy because it's not good for us. <laughs> you know? I mean, what kind of hubris is that? Uh, it's a hubris that comes from thinking that you are the world's um, essential nation, that the world can't exist without you. Uh, but guess what? Russia and China can exist. And they reject this. And they formally said, there will be no more unilateral world. We will no longer recognize the United States as the singularity around which the world gravitates. It's now going to be a multipolar world, one that is a law-based international order, the law being the United Nations Charter, meaning Russia and China aren't trying to rewrite the system. They're embracing the system the world agreed upon in 1945. They're saying this will be it, but it's going to be a United Nations where we have multi, multiple poles of influence, like the BRICS, Brazil, South Africa, India, Russia, China. Imagine that. Um, everybody is equal. Imagine that. <laughs> and, and they also said, you know, this concept of American economic hegemony that's linked to this transatlantic alliance. No, we're focused on a trans-Eurasian economic union that connects Russia with China through Central Asia uh, and with, through India, Pakistan, uh, inclusive of the, 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 the Indo-Pacific region, reaching into Africa, basically two thirds of the world's population is part of the Russian Chinese economic union. Now, it, this is a statement, when I heard it, I sat up and went, this is one of the most fundamentally important documents in modern history, because it, it, it represents a complete revolution, a departure from, um, from, from the US dominance of the world. But the problem with a paper revolution is, it's meaningless. It's hard to implement on its own. You need you need a push, and Russia and China weren't going to start the push on their own. The United States started the push. How? The United States has been sanctioning everybody <laughs> for for years, and they and they never work. But we had told Russia, if you remember, uh, Biden had that um, that uh, summit with Putin in June of 2021 in Geneva. You know, the one where he famously looked Putin in the eye and called him a soulless killer, and uh, I mean, all this other tough talk. But the other thing he did is he looked Putin in the eye and said, if you invade Russia, we're going to hit you with the most massive sanctions you've ever seen. It's going to hurt you, man, or whatever, how Biden never talks. Um, you know, but he, you know, he's, he's going to bring pain. The pain is going to be brought down. And Putin saw him and Putin heard. Well, yeah, Putin saw him, Putin heard. Putin went back to Moscow and said, hey, if we go into Ukraine, they're going to hit us with sanctions. What do we do about it? And they prepared. And one of the ways they prepared, and this is where the ignorance of the United States comes into play. Because of the 1990s, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the American economic exploitation of Russia, Russia had become inexorably intertwined with the Western economy. About 20 to 25 percent of the Russian middle class um, is, is linked to the West economically, culturally. Um, you know, and you can't divorce that. If Putin ever said, I want to cut relations with the West, he'd be voted out of office because this group is a politically empowered group that isn't going to play ball. They want relations with the West. You have the oligarch class that, again, Yeltsin breathed life into. These are very corrupt people who stole the national wealth, made it their own, and, um, and, and, and enjoy monopolies. When Putin came to power, he said, I understand I can't shut you down because you, you control our economy. I'm going to let you stay in the ec economy, but you're out of politics. If you stick your nose into politics, I cut you off the knees. And he did. He, he took over Gazprom. He kicked uh, or, or, or Luke Oil, I think, uh, or, and he kicked the, the, the oligarch out of the country. Several, several of them fled, but many of them there. A lot of people talk about the ignorant people say Putin needs the oligarchs, that he's part of the corruption of the oligarchs. Oh, Putin hates the oligarchs. He just can't get rid of them because economically they're too ingrained. Well, <laughs> what did Biden do? First of all, he, he broadcast what he was going to do. So Putin was able to get a plan. And then he did what he said he was going to do. 
cut off the economic system, a complete economic divorce with, the, with Russia, between the West and Russia. He just did Putin a favor. Putin, had Putin initiated that divorce, people would be in the streets rioting, he'd be out of office. But the United States initiated the divorce and Putin went, thank you very much, we're done with you. We're finished. We are never again going to allow Western economy to be able to dictate to, to Russian national security interests. It's a divorce, full, final, and complete goodbye. And the Russian people are like, oh my God, but the West did it. They can't blame Putin. What else did we do? We seized all the assets of the oligarchs. Guess who don't have any money anymore? The oligarchs. And without money, you think they got power? Putin gave a speech a couple of weeks ago where he told him, get the hell out of Russia. He's talking to the oligarchs. Leave. You're not real Russians. You've been stealing from us. You've been living a life of luxury. And we no longer need you. We no longer want you. We did put the greatest favor he ever had. We've empowered him in a way that was unimaginable because he was trapped by the Western economy, by the interlinking between Russia and the West. No longer. It's a divorce. And it's a divorce that's coming out in his favor. You remember how Biden bragged? I collapsed the ruble. As if that's something really cool to do. I collapsed the stock market. Just let's put on our humanitarian hat. That's a word we like to use. How would we feel as Americans if a foreign power on a whim decided to shut down our economy? We're all unemployed now. We, we, we don't have a paycheck, but we still have mortgages. So we're going to lose our homes. We have kids in college that can't go to college anymore because we don't have any money. We're going hungry. We're homeless. All because some idiot overseas decided he wanted to shut down our economy. Well, that's what we were doing to the Russians. So any American who sits there and says, no, we need to do that. Really? We need to screw 139 million people like that? You would never tolerate it if it happened to you. That's what we were doing to the Russians. But fortunately for the people of Russia, Putin was told in advance what we were going to do. So he sat there and he said, really? You're going you're gonna to seize my sovereign wealth fund that's composed of euros and dollars in your banks that I use to pay off all my debt and make the, our economies interact? Thank you. Because what I'm going to do now is empower the ruble. You guys got a dollar that's worthless. It's based upon a debt run economy, a you know, petroleum dollar that we're going to rip away because the world's not going to be paying for petroleum dollars pretty soon. They're going to be using other currencies like, imagine, the ruble, which is now linked to the gold standard. Russia's been stockpiling gold for 20 years under Putin, and they got a whole bunch of it, and he just linked the ruble to gold. And guess what the ruble's doing today? Boom. It is more powerful now than it has been in a long time. We collapse the Russian stock market, not on your life. Look at it, up four, five, six, eight percent per day. It's doing well. You know who's not doing well? Europe. Europe is hurting bad. Why? Because the United States promised things we couldn't deliver. We promised them that we will get them the oil, the coal, the gas they need. We had a plan B. Turns out we didn't have a plan B. We can't get them what they need. And if they cut themselves off from Russia, their economies literally shut down overnight. Not just temporarily, German economists are warning Chancellor Scholz that this could be a permanent damage to the German economy. It will never recover. This will be worse than the Second World War. And that's what's about to happen to Germany. That's what's about to happen to France. That's what's about to happen to all of Europe, except those countries that have said, yeah, we're going to play ball. Hungary ain't going to suffer because Hungary just agreed to buy all their energy in rubles which is the other thing that Putin said. He said, you want to cut me off my sovereign wealth? Okay, <laughs> I don't care about dollars and euros anymore. Get rid of them. I don't want them. I only care about one currency. That's the ruble. And if you want my gas, you got to pay me in rubles. It's a brilliant move. Putin has literally checkmated the West on their economic sanctions. Is there some belt tightening in Russia? Yeah. But right now, I guarantee you, if you go to a Russian supermarket, there ain't no empty shelves. Go to a German supermarket. Shells are empty, man. They got nothing. And I don't mean to gloat because I have family that lives in Europe and all this, and I, I feel sorry for the civilians. But this is I'll leave you with this. Most people who are watching this are old enough to remember the, 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 19, uh, the, the election of Bill Clinton in 1992. And uh, he had an advisor named James Carville. And Clinton was running around talking about foreign policy and this and that, you know, save the world, you know, all this. And, and Carville said, shut up, man. There's only one thing to get you elected. It's the economy, stupid. People vote their pocketbooks. And you want to talk about a path out of this predicament? 
every single one of these European nations are ostensible democracies. And I can guarantee you that uh, Schultz's political future is very short. If, Germans, if the German economy collapses, there will be an immediate vote of no confidence in the German parliament. He will be tossed out and they will bring in a politician who will, use, who will focus on you know, saving the German economy. And that means all this sanction nonsense is over. That means all this artificial propping up of a neo-Nazi regime in Ukraine is over. And Russia was planning on this. You know, right now, NATO's saying, hey, we're strong. We're more united than ever. No, you're not. You're not united when four NATO members disregard the sanctions and are buying uh, 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 gas and rubles. You're not united when Turkey blames this war on NATO, not on Russia. You're not united when Germany is, threat is, is going to be pulling out of this whole arrangement pretty soon. NATO is weak, and this is the Russian plan. The Russians have two major objectives now from this. One, after the Ukrainian victory, one is a new European security framework that respects the legitimate national security interests of Russia that keeps NATO away from its borders. This is going to happen within the next five years because Europe cannot sustain this American vision of a strong NATO. How is Germany going to pay for pay $100 billion to rebuild their military when their economy is in the dirt? Ain't going to happen. The United States, uh, General Walters, the, the commander of the U U U.S. forces in Europe, testified before Congress, and the Congress said, fry them out. We're giving you $839 billion. So you're going to send troops over to Europe, right? He said, no, we're going to wait until after Ukraine settles down. Why? Well, because this is a political problem. Um, who's going to invite us? Well, don't they want us there? Maybe not. And even if they do want it, who's going to pay for it? Because we're not paying for it. It costs over $2 billion a year to have pre-positioned equipment for one American brigade in Poland. <laughs> and we're talking about sending over eight brigades, that's $16 billion just to house them. Now you got to feed them. You got to train them and equip them. Who's going to pay for that? Because the American taxpayer ain't paying for that. Europe will have to underwrite it and no European country can afford that. So this concept of NATO unity is a farce. Russia will impose, I believe, a new European security framework um, on Europe in the next five years. It could be very risky though, because if Finland and, and, and Sweden decide to join NATO, that complicates things. But I have confidence that the Russians have a plan. Why? Because they said they have a plan and Putin don't bluff. And then the other thing is the strategic uh, shift away from American domination. The, the age of American hegemony is over. We, 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 we're the Titanic, we've hit the iceberg. The iceberg is called Russia and Ukraine and we're in a long, slow process of sinking. It's over. Um, China right now has learned something. And, and their Chinese ambassador gave us a heads up. Before the Putin meeting, uh, the Chinese ambassador uh, spoke with NPR, and uh, he said, you know, relations with the U.S. and China are very bad. And um, if they don't change, if the U.S. continues to float around like, it, like it's a power, there will be a war with the United States. He said it right up front. There will be a war with the United States. And then they entered the special relationship with Russia. Russia entered the special relationship knowing that China is going to war in Taiwan and they're going to fight the United States, and Russia didn't walk away from that. Think about that for a second. And then Russia turned around and invaded Ukraine, and China isn't walking away from Russia. Sadly, something is probably going to happen in the next five to seven years is China is going to invade Taiwan. And there's not a darn thing the United States can do about it. The world has fundamentally changed. And here's the other truth. It didn't need to happen. This war in Ukraine did not need to happen. This could have been solved peacefully. Nobody needed to die. Nobody needed to die. But American hubris, American hubris and American, the, the power, the, the, the greed for, for power started this war, and it's going to cost Taiwan. Taiwan doesn't need to be invaded by China, but they're going to be invaded by China. Hundreds of thousands of Taiwanese are going to die because the United States thinks it has a right to dictate outcomes to other nations. When the reality is China right now would accept Taiwan to join China as it is. No fundamental changes. Keep the government. Keep the economy. Keep whatever you want. You will wake up the next morning and there will be no change except that you will be flying the Chinese uh, con uh, the, the flag of, of, of mainland China, not the Taiwanese flag. You really want to die for a piece of cloth? One that the United States isn't going to back you up on? If Taiwan has learned anything anything, the United States is the worst friend in the world. Ask the Ukrainians how good of a friend we are. 
We're willing to fight the Russians to the last Ukrainian, and we'll be willing to fight the Chinese to the last Taiwanese. That's the sad thing. And if you're anti-war, this has to be the biggest nightmare in the world because we're oh. seeing a major war in Europe that should have been avoided, and we're going to see a major war in the Pacific. Yeah, no, it, it's crazy. And I, I wanted to mention that, you know, you, you talked about sanctions and, and in reality, most of them are what we call unilateral coercive economic measures. They're, they're not legal structures, they're illegal economic measures imposed unilaterally by the United States on other countries and mostly countries in the global south, more than a third of the world's population, more than a third of the countries we're, we're sanctioning or sanctioning are in the African continent. You know, and, and, the, and the global south is not going along with the U.S. on this. Everything that we've done has been to isolate us and undermine ourselves and, and show that we can't be trusted. I uh, interviewed Michael Hudson a few weeks ago, and he basically said March 23rd was the day, the day we seized the Russian assets after seizing Venezuela's and Afghanistan's. The whole world now sees it. You can't trust the United States. So this is a game-changing situation. Um, there's a number of things. I would like to talk a, bit, a little bit about Biden. You know, some of the things that, that he said, that if you could comment on, um, he's talked about, uh, you know, we just have to pay these higher fuel prices. We're all going to have to pay higher prices for food as, as a result of this. This is just the price that we pay. Uh, he's talked openly about, uh, well, pretty strongly alluded to wanting regime change in Russia. And you've talked about Biden's role in Ukraine and in the coup in 2014 and his the ways that he's compromised in terms of, of Ukraine. So if you could talk kind of about your take on, on Biden and all of this. Well, in, I think in, in fairness to full disclosure, I have to um, say that I don't like Joe Biden. And the uh, my, my feelings for him are deeply personal. Uh, they, they go back to... Uh, the fall of 1998, when I resigned from the United Nations, I testified before the United States Senate, and Joe Biden um, behaved in a uh, in, 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 in probably one of the least professional uh, appearances of his entire unprofessional career, um, mocking me, mocking what I was trying to do, calling me Scotty Boy, uh, saying that it was above my pay grade. That's why other people get the limos and I don't. Um, so. You know, I, I, I just the saying that I'm as human as the next person, and um, that didn't sit well with me. And so I've, I've never really recovered from that. And then I also haven't recovered from his role in, um, in greenlighting the war on Iraq. He was in a unique position to stop that war. He could have held kind of hearings that could have educated the American people about the reality of the threat posed by Iraq or the lack of threat uh, and the real situation about WMD. Uh, and he chose not to. He chose to, um, to, to, to maintain a lie. The other thing we'll say about Joe Biden is he is a natural born liar. Uh, and I'm not talking about, I'm not gonna get into the pettiness about his uh, plagiarism and things like that. Um, I'm talking about big picture lies. And I'll give you a recent example. In uh, July of last year, um, we had a situation where Biden made a decision he's gonna pull out of Afghanistan. And, um, and he was starting to do that. Um, and the situation, the internal security situation in Afghanistan was falling apart. Ashraf Ghani, the Afghan president, called Biden. And he panicked. He said, I got 15,000 Taliban and, and Pakistani insurgents pouring over the border. My army's on the verge of collapse. If you don't continue to give us air support, uh, it's, it's going to be over. We're going to be gone in a matter of days. Um, and Biden shut him up and said, whoa, 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 you can't say that. What I need you to do, and this is virtually a direct quote. People can look it up and see if I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. What I need you to do is go out and say everything's okay. Everything's under control. And here's the important one. Even if it's not true, we need to create the perception of control. So he's ordering someone to lie, not just to his own people, but in a statement that will be heard by the American people. So they're lying to the American people. And um, he's saying this to, to, to achieve a perception that deviates from reality. That's Joe Biden. He is, he is a liar. On Ukraine, he is... He has compromised every which way but Sunday. Uh, we, we, we saw his involvement in, um, in the Maidan. Uh, he was involved um, you know, uh, in, in shaping uh, the Ukrainian government. We saw his direct interference with, uh, with the uh, prosecutor case, you know, where he bragged, uh, son of a bitch, a billion dollars. I mean, that's, that's what he did. That's what he does. Um, I'm not going to get into his son, except what the hell is this son who has no qualifications doing? At the you know on the board of 
of a major uh, energy uh, money laundering uh, group. Burisma is not a legitimate energy broker. It is a money laundering machine specifically there to create a mechanism to buy American politicians. You'll be surprised how many photographs you see of all these officials that are on TV today talking about the great, wonderful Ukrainian democracy, they all have photos in their photo album, because I've seen them, of them sitting there at a Burisma site with a Burisma jacket on it, and in their pocket is a nice little Burisma check, because they're all bought and paid for. Burisma owns everything directly or indirectly, because that's what the Ukrainian government created them to do. Biden is, corru is corrupt. I'm not going to say that he is personally corrupt, but he's intellectually and morally corrupt on the issue of Ukraine. And therefore, you know, if this was any other situation, he would have to recuse himself <laughs> from this. But he's the president of the United States, so he can't recuse himself. Um, but, you know, we, we, we are married to a, a policy that makes no sense. Literally, our, our Ukrainian policy makes no sense. It's not good for Ukraine, um, and it's no longer good for the United States. I mean, all the, all the corruption money that we used to have that, that bought off our politician, that's, that, that's going to be gone. And the people that are caught in the middle are the Ukrainian people. I mean, no matter where you stand on the issue of Stepan Bandera, the Nazis, uh, whether Russia's right or wrong, my God, if you're not crying every night for the people of Ukraine, you're not human. Because they don't deserve this. And yet that's, this is their lot. This is a lot of other people. I see a lot of statements about uh, Palestine. I don't want to get into that because that's a totally separate subject. But yes, the Palestinian people are suffering every day, and they should not be ignored. The people of Yemen are suffering. The people of Iran are suffering. The people of Venezuela are suffering. Everybody who is put on the receiving end of American corrupt policy, because there is no uncorrupt American policy. Everything we touch breaks and dies. And most of those policies were crafted by Joe Biden, who's been involved in policy formulation and implementation for nearly five decades. Everything he touches dies. Literally, and he's the commander in chief. He's the guy we got. I don't know if I answered your questions. I might've gone off on a tangent there. I apologize. Uh, Joe, you got to unmute. Am I muted? No. No, 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 no me. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> most people try to mute me a lot, but um, so we're, we're approaching two hours. Um, what I'd like to do is maybe just see, um, Scott, if you have a last comment and then see if Margaret has a last comment. I will make a last comment and tell people some housekeeping stuff of how they can get the recording as well as all the stuff that came in the chat. Um, and uh, then we'll call it a night. I'm sorry we haven't been able to get to questions, but uh, it's getting pretty long. And it's possible we can look at some of these questions and answer them in another format at another time and uh, get back back to people because we have the emails of everybody who registered and we can we can get back to you. So Scott, do you have a last uh, um, closing thought? It's one that I, I obviously, I, I mean, I, I'm gonna say I'm uncomfortable in this position, uh, meaning, you know, is, is a voice that people are listening to and, um, and maybe uh, taking everything I say at face value and, and as the gospel. Um, because if you're doing that, you're committing the same mistake I believe Americans make when they watch mainstream media. <laughs> you know, nothing's the gospel. So tonight, what, what I would ask the people listening in is uh, to treat me instead as an agent of uh, propaganda working on behalf of the United States government to disseminate disinformation. Don't believe a word I said. Assume everything I said was a lie. Write down what I said and go out and research it and try and prove me wrong. And if it turns out that what I said was right, great. Now you've empowered yourself by doing your own research into a topic, and you're and, and, and now you have some information that isn't just derived from listening to somebody say something, but you actively researching the topic and getting to know it. And if you do that, I think we 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 are we we've done a great service here because democracy dies the moment the citizens stop becoming informed constituents. We and we inform ourselves not by listening to others but by actively participating in a process of debate, dialogue, and discussion that empowers us with knowledge and information so that we can hold those when we elect a higher office accountable for what they do in our name. And I think that this has been a very valuable um, 
uh, forum for that. I thank you very much for inviting me here. But again, I just ask everybody who watched, go out and do your own research and view this as a, as a jump start to it, but not as the end all. Thanks. Thank you, Scott. Uh, Margaret, do you have any closing thoughts? Yeah, and, and Scott, I want to thank you so much. I know it's it's not a fun position to be in, but uh, we really appreciate your courage and integrity in, in speaking out on, on these issues and educating us. I just, you know, think to, I want to thank everyone for being here because it's so critical that you took the time to be here and learn this information. And now you have a task, which is to go and share this information with others. I've seen a lot of people concerned about um, being able to share this. Yes, this will be up on YouTube. It's up on the UNAC Facebook page. People have been sharing it out. We'll have a copy of the chat that folks will get access to. So, um, so you will have this, you will be able to share it out, but, but, it's so important that we cut through the lies that are being told, the blatant lies uh, that are getting people to cheer us into a major conflict. And, a, and a, we, had, we didn't even get a chance to talk about that. And maybe we will be able to do a second session. People have been asking about that. So we'll have to discuss the possibility, be, possibility of that. But you know, I think this is, this is a, the world is changing right now in a way that it was, you know, many were predicting, but it's happening very quickly. And so it's up to us to, to educate people, to cut through the lies, and to continue to put pressure, uh, raise awareness and put pressure on our own government uh, to stop the destructive acts that we're taking. So um, so I want to thank everyone for being here, and I'll, I'll stop there and get off my soapbox. But thank you, Scott. Thanks. Well, I, I want to thank everybody, too. <laughs> and thanks, Scott and, and Margaret, of course. Um, you know, it's important that we get together and we discuss this stuff and talk about the truth. I'm sure everyone is feeling like I'm feeling, that when we see the truth of what's going on in Ukraine and have studied it a little bit and try to speak about it, uh, they try to shut us down. They try to shut us down by closing our Twitter accounts. We haven't mentioned that Scott was closed down today. They took him off Twitter. Um, all of us censor ourselves a little bit, you know, on Facebook, I know that if I put something that looks violent, they're going to stop me. Um, so we tend to censor ourselves and it's, it's difficult. So it's important that we get together and it's also really important that we keep on speaking truth to power. It's, we're going to win this. We're going to win this um, whole uh, uh, propaganda war. We're going to win uh, to uh, the war that will change our society to one that is beneficial to all the people. But we have to do it and we have to stay together. So, as I said, tomorrow, 24 hours after this um, form, you will get from Zoom, open it up, um, uh, 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 some information that will say thank you for coming and registering or thank you for registering. Sorry, you couldn't come. But at the bottom, there'll be a link and the link will be to the video of this um, uh, meeting tonight. And below that, I will have a link which will include the chat. So if you saw something that was in the chat that you thought was interesting and it scrolled by, you have access to that. So open that email from Zoom tomorrow around uh, this time. And we do hope to continue to do these things. We have to, this is a situation that's changing very, very rapidly. Um, uh, and what's gonna happen at the end of it is gonna require a lot of thought and a lot of um, people getting together and organizing to make sure that we can live well, that the people in Ukraine can live well, the people in Russia can live well, and we can have a world that's seriously a world of peace and justice, which is what we're all fighting for. So thanks again. Um, uh, you'll see this information I talked about soon. Um, keep in touch with UNAC at unacpeace.org. Um, Margaret, you wanted to say what popular resistance uh, URL is? Or put sure, it in the chat. Oh um, yeah, popularresistance.org and, and check out our podcast, Clearing the Fog. And again, thank you, Scott. So we'll see all you again soon. Take care.